So I'm Milton Talbot from the IFP, and uh, we're really pleased tonight to have Nermeen Sheikh here. Nermeen is a broadcast news producer and weekly co-host at Democracy Now! here in New York City, and um, she'll coordinate uh, the discussion here with uh, Nick and Orlando. Nermeen, it's great to have you back at Envision, and take it away. Thank you so much, Milton. So I'll just make a couple of um, very brief remarks and then speak to our uh, two panelists, including, of course, the director of this uh, powerful and beautiful film uh, that you just saw. Joseph Conrad uh, visited the Congo in 1890, arriving with the assumption that he was a civilized human being. He used his experiences there in writing Heart of Darkness and a less well-known short story called An Outpost of Progress. It was only later that he realized that in his own words, this is Conrad, before the Congo, I was just a mere animal. The animal to which Conrad referred was paradoxically civilized European humanity whose assumptions of superiority helped cause the deaths of millions and millions of people in the Congo. I mention this because that seems to me the concept underlying the making and presentation of Virunga, a confrontation, intellectual, aesthetic, and emotional, with the cost of acting in an unexamined way on the assumption that progress development and civilization can or even should be understood synonymously or unproblematically. This idea necessitates, as we see in the film, certain actions on the part of those who are the bearers of these ideas, those who have progressed and developed, in other words, those who have become civilized. An analogous relationship is that of a parent to a child, the logic is simple and clearly articulated halfway through the film by Julien, the SOCO representative, who says the best solution effective for everyone is to recolonize these countries. He goes on to explain we have to manage them because they cannot manage themselves. They are like children. They are not mature enough, I'd say. It is that logic, though often in a more benevolent way, in the sense of caring for those who cannot care for themselves, that extends from one group of humans to another. From European colonizers, the civilized, for example, to the darker places of the earth, and of course, from humans to so-called lesser forms of life, like animals, to say nothing of the rest of nature, or of the voracious and predatory form that this logic takes under capitalism and under conditions of hyper-capitalism, which is what this film, Virunga, demonstrates. It is finally the unexamined acceptance of this managerial logic, which is predicated on an explicit hierarchy that is not only temporal, but also material, ethical, and intellectual, which dictates that certain lives, and more than that, certain ways of life are more valuable, more worthy of being preserved than others. And this film, Virunga, reveals to us the devastation this logic brings in its wake, especially in more malevolent hands. And for that, we must thank Orlando von Eisendel. So thank you for revealing all that you do in this extremely beautiful and powerful film. And with that, I'd like to introduce our two uh, uh, panelists. Orlando is, of course, the director of Virunga and co-founder of Grain Media. He's an award-winning filmmaker whose documentaries have spanned Africa, Asia, America, and the Arctic. Virunga is Orlando's first feature. Nick Sacron, to my right, uh, was recently appointed Chief of Profession for Sustainable Development in the Bureau for Policy and Program Support at UNDP, that is the United Nations Development Program. In this role, he oversees work on development planning, sustainable livelihoods, and natural resource management. He's been at UNDP since 1998, in which capacity he's worked on the ground in over 40 countries. 
Prior to his present post, Mr. Sekran was head of the UNDP Ecosystems and Biodiversity Program. So I'd like to begin by, by uh, um, asking Orlando, I mean, there's so many spectacular uh, uh, features to this film, but first of all, how did you learn of what was happening uh, at, at, uh, in Virunga? And then most amazing, how did you come up with this technique of the hidden camera and, and the French journalist who captures all of these diabolical words being spoken by the Soko representative? Okay. Um, well, first of all, thank you all for giving up your, your Tuesday evening to, to come and see the film. Um, it's always a real honor to share the range of stories with, with everybody. Um, I initially, this, this started, I, I was interested in trying to tell uh, a positive story from Eastern Congo. Um, the, the, you know, it's part of the world that most of the, the, the news which comes out of it is incredibly negative. Um, uh, it's about violence, war, um, sexual exploitation. And those are obviously incredibly important stories, but, but I wanted to try and tell something different. And I came across the story of the rangers of Runga National Park um, and these guys risking their lives to protect mountain gorillas and push forward these really ambitious development projects. Um, and so eventually I, I, I went out and I started working with, with the rangers. Um, and I'd, I'd been on the ground just a couple of weeks when this new civil war started. Um, and, and around the same time, I learned about the park's very serious concerns about illegal oil exploration by Soko International. So, so very quickly, the story I'd set out to, to make transformed dramatically. Um, I still like to think that, that overall, at the end, that some of the hope and optimism that, that we tried to that we set out to, to make, to, to capture at the beginning, still kind of comes through. Um, and, and then I your second part of your question, um, how did we decide to, to document what Soko was doing? Um, well, I should say that there was a number of very brave people already doing that on the ground. There was a number of civil society groups and, and the rangers themselves who had already started to do that work. And then when, when I first got involved, and my background is I used to make a lot of journalistic investigations um, uh, using hidden cameras. And, and so we brought um, that technology with us and we started to document, uh, you know, sort of slotted onto the work that was already happening and started to, to document what they were doing wi with these cameras. And as part of that, one day I met Melanie Gooby, who's an incredibly brave young woman, um, and she happened to know one or two of the SoCo guys. Um, and we had a, a chat one day and it, I, I, she told me that and I told her a little bit about what we'd been doing and, and we decided to, to join forces and, and work together. And then the results of some of her meetings you see, uh, you see in the film. Thank you so much, Orlando. Now, Nick, you've worked so uh, for so long and in so many different places on, on the issue of biodiversity. So having watched this film, to what extent does it reflect the situation um, elsewhere? To what extent is it, a ki is kind is it representative, say? Well, um, there are 65 major conflicts taking place across the planet at this time. And looking at it from a biodiversity perspective, um, there are biodiversity isn't distributed across the planet equally. Um, there are some areas that are more important than others. We call these biodiversity hotspots. It cover, they cover just 2.3% of the planetary surface. There are 35 of them, yet they have 50% of plant endemics, 43% of endemics, mammals, amphibians, and so on. And nine of these areas fall in conflict zones. And so not only is the East um, African Afromontane forest a hotspot, falls in a conflict zone as we've seen so vividly, but also the Andi Andes and um, the Western Ghats of India where, uh, and Eastern Ghats of India where there's a Maoist revolution and so on. And so we're seeing this story parodied in, in many, many places. Now, it's a bit complicated. Um, not always does conflict lead to um, a conservation challenge. I mean, there are some people who suggest that the piracy <laughs> taking place off Somalia is actually protecting fish stocks and, and reefs in that area. But I've been witness um, elsewhere, for instance in Borneo, to what happens when you, ha you get the constellation, perfect constellation of vested interests, corrupt 
politicians, local politicians and, and businesses in terms of what might happen to protected areas. And I saw another park, um, um, Kutai National Park in Borneo, home to um, a large orangutan populations decimated. It's now got 30% of its original forest cover. And what I found really um, in inspiring about your film was the story about Rodrigue, it was the story you know, about Melanie, but it was the story around um, the p all the park staff, Andre, very charismatic, who's, who's, who've stuck it out and kind of fighting the good cause and the cause of governance. And I think that's very inspiring. I didn't see that happen in Kutai and we lost the park. But here in Africa, in Virunga, in the most difficult circumstances, you have people fighting that battle, and I think that's the inspiring story. Well, I think that's a really, that's a very good point, because one of the other things that you managed to do in this film, which, um, you know, seems uh, highly un uncommon, is the proximity and the trust that you build with the park rangers and therefore also with the animals. I mean, the shots, you're very close, it seems, uh, to the gorillas. So how did you develop that kind of trust with this community? Uh, I think I just hung around long enough <laughs> and they all got <laughs> bored of me and my camera and just forgot that I was there. Um, no, I mean, I, 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 spent, um, I spent just under a year in living in the park um, and um, so you lived in the park itself. Yeah, there's a there's a little. I mean, Rumangabo it's called. It's a little kind of encampment on the top of a of a forested hill, um, and there's a tented camp there. And the range, everyone lives. It's it's pretty simple, <laughs> um, and that yeah, that's 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 where we live. Um, so you know, you spend every minute of the day with with the with the guys that I was filming, and you, you, you know, we built quite very strong friendships. And Nick, one of the things um, that, that this film uh, brings out, of course, is the threat to, to, to the animals, to wildlife, uh, to this, this, this park I itself. Um, and, and biodiversity is now threatened uh, at an unprecedented rate. Uh, could you explain wha why is that? Wha why what's happened? What's changed? Well, <laughs> we're sort of in an unprecedented social experiment at the moment. I mean, the world population is expected to plateau at 10 billion people. And um, the question is to whether we're hardwired as a species to sort of operate on that scale. You know, we make decisions typically with small groups of people um, and m m very difficult when you sort of move to the larger scales. And that's why we struggle so much when it deals to sort of w managing globalization. And I think that really, is a, that it really is a key issue. I mean, it's a sort of more existential issue um, in, in terms of our existence and, 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 and what c what's causing these challenges. Of course, with it comes a huge consumption pressure. Um, in the Virungas, you're looking at a population density, I think, of about 300 um, per square kilometer um, people. There's um, 100,000 people immediately around the boundary of the park, four or five million people in the immediate proximity, including Goma. Um, and, and of course, there are local pressures in terms of charcoal use and so on. But if you look at the global pressure in terms of use of resources, and it's massive, you know. There's nearly two billion cubic meters of fuel wood consumed each year, either as fuel wood or as, as charcoal. That's something like 70 million Amazonian trees, you know, pretty big, bigger than our New York trees. So that's, that's, that's an enormous, um, uh, an enormous um, consumption, and of course that has a major impact. But underneath it all is governance. Um, if you have good governance, you can manage things. I mean, India, the state of in Kerala, has a population density of 700 people per square kilometer, but yet has some really well-managed parks. Um, and one of the last great hopes in India for tiger populations, for instance. So it is possible to do, but you need peace, stability, and governance. And that's really at the heart of it. Um, when, you, when it's n lacking, we face the sort of challenges that we see in the film today. Unfortunately, that's, um, as I said earlier, um, something we see very commonly across the planet. Where you have it, um, it makes a big difference, and you can actually confront many of these challenges and find solutions. A and Orlando, um, to what extent um, is what's happening in Virunga representative of, I mean, Congo is a huge country, to what extent is it representative of the challenges that the rest of the country confronts? Well, I mean, uh, the, the very beginning of the film, it, it, it's, you know, we, we, we set up this, this, there's been this pattern, there's been a cycle that's been happening in Congo for the last 150 years, um, which, you know, simplified is, is outsiders coming in, taking away resources, and often the results on the ground are incredibly bad for, 
for, for, the, for Congolese people. And, and what we realized quite quickly that what was happening in Virunga was, 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 a, was a very clear cut example of that, or it, you know, it was gonna be a very clear cut example of that going forward. Um, but, but also I would, I would say that, that you know, as, as Nick's sort of just been discussing, that, that what's happening there is, is also a metaphor for what's happening in the wider world with, with conservation areas for across the planet. And, and what I probably should say about Virunga, and this is why this place is, is particularly worrying here, is because this is Africa's oldest national park. It's home to the last of the world's mountain gorillas. And you know, if, if Virunga falls in the face of shadowy business interests, it's, you know, what hope is there for, for anywhere, really? So it's 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 really it's particularly important that a line is drawn in th in th here to and we don't allow this incredibly important place to fall um, against Soko International's illegal exploitation of the oil. I mean, this this screening is also taking place um, in a in an extremely timely uh, uh, moment because, as as all of you know, because I s I think um, Ed Norton spoke of it uh, uh, earlier. There is a meeting of, of um, uh, heads of state about uh, the issue of climate, uh, and there's also a massive climate march uh, on Sunday in, in this city, in New York. So I'd like to ask Nick what you see. I understand the problems of governance, and, and obviously that's, that's crucial, but what do you see as the links, first of all, between uh, uh, biodiversity and climate change on the one hand, and then all these climate activists who make the argument that biodiversity can only be threatened under uh, the conditions uh, where, under conditions where capitalism is allowed to run rampant. I mean, SOCO might be an extreme example of it, but in many cases, the law is consistent with, in fact, uh, let's just say the degradation of the environment. Okay, so um, two parts to that question. I'll take the second part first. Um, and it looks at really the cost-benefit calculus um, that is inherent in land use decisions. Um, take the extractives sector. Its global value is $3,700 billion. It's massive, okay? And, it's, and if you just look at what's happening in Africa, we're looking at over $350 um, um, billion dollars in terms of the formal trade and over $200 billion in illicit outflows from the sector. It's pretty formidable, okay? So it really, in my view, still boils down to governance. Maybe it's business governance. Maybe it's not um, necessarily the controls that can be exercised by the countries such as Congo, but it is the controls that are exercised by chambers of commerce, the controls that are uh, exercised by you know, business interests and us, all of us who own shares, um, Soko is a public um, traded company. So the question is, um, do we vote with our feet? Do we, what, what do we support? Ultimately, we need to make choices as consumers um, in terms of the decisions we make. That has an impact down through the supply chain on the bottom line of companies and what happens on the ground. And so that's really, that really is critical. And why um, next week is important is that you have a number of progressive companies ready to stand up and commit to taking action using their supply chains as, as, as a means of control to change the manner in which business is done and to change um, land use um, as a consequence. I'm not going to reveal any more, but please watch this space because um, we at UNDP are responsible for the forest um, um, part of, of, the, of the climate Secretary General's Climate Summit and, and, and there are a number of exciting um, initiatives that, to be that will be um, announced. Now globally, um, and I'll be very quick here, but globally some 25% of um, greenhouse gas emissions comes from um, land use change and forest loss. But a very large portion of current emissions are currently sequestered through the oceans and, and, and by forests. And um, if we lose that ability, the, the, the danger of runaway climate change is, 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 is very, very high. And so ecosystems are critical, um, both in terms of you know, reducing emissions, absorbing emissions, but also in terms of allowing us to adapt, um, you know, uh, providing us with the sea walls and the barriers, you know, as mangroves do, um, against storm surges and the like. So that's why they're critical. Um, biodiversity, unfortunately, is very threatened by climate change. There are a number of endemic species, many found in the Virungas, because um, the change in climate, uh, change in temperatures, a change in precipitation will have an impact on their survival, and that's something which is very worrisome indeed. 
Well, I mean, obviously the, the, the costs as uh, perceived by companies, and I'm sure not only companies are extremely high, one of the things that's very shocking I at the end of the film, you see the text and you hear that this is the Belgian director, Emmanuel de Merode, has actually been shot. So could you, could you talk about what you know of what happened? Sokol apparently denied any involvement, uh, obviously, in his uh, what, the attempted murder. Um, and, and is he now back in, in Durinda? Sure. Um, so what, what happened is um, on, on April the 15th, of this year, this is just the day before we actually launched this film uh, at the Tribeca Film Festival, um, Emmanuel handed over a dossier of evidence against Soko's activities to the Congolese legal authorities. And on that same day as, as he returned to the park, he was ambushed by three gunmen and his car was sprayed with bullets and he was shot through the chest and shot through the stomach. Um, the, the gunmen were unknown. There's absolutely no evidence to suggest it had anything to do with, with, with Soko. Um, uh, but, you know, true to form, Emmanuel, only 30 days later after, after this, was back in the park, and he remains as committed as ever to protecting Virunga. Thank you. Um, I, I'd like to actually now open uh, the conversation up uh, to the audience. So if any of you have any questions, please just raise your hands and I'll call on you. And I believe there's someone with a microphone, yes, um, who will pass you a mic and just wait to ask at the microphone. Uh, the, the person all the way at the on the right, that, that's you. Sorry, the person with his hand, that's, yeah, him. <laughs> well, not you, him. Yeah, I'm, I'm <coughs> curious, if, if all they do is watch, why is it useful to have troops from the UN there? So could you say whom you're addressing your question to? Any of you who may know the answer to the question. <laughs> Being in that part of the world, you know how complicated it is to keep the peace. Unfortunately, the peacekeepers work under most extraordinarily difficult circumstances. They provide a huge humanitarian service to communities, but, ul but ultimately, when things break down, as they did in this particular case, they're not actually given a mandate to enter into battle. And were they to enter into battle, um, I would have serious questions as to what the outcome might be. I think. Ultimately, um, their role is, is, is to support the local population, provide humanitarian support, basic um, um, law and order support, um, and not t to wage war. I can, maybe I can just uh, very quick clarify on that. I, just, uh, I should say that since the film was finished, there was a, um, the M23 got pushed out of the park and that was by the Congolese army and, um, and a, a, a kind of international force of, of, of UN troops. And, um, and the reason I tell you that is because you can now go and, and visit the guerrillas safely. Um, uh, it's not like going on holiday to Mexico, or, or actually maybe that's not that safe anyway, but it's not like going on holiday <laughs> to, uh, to, um, to Florida. <laughs> Um, but um, it is one very direct way that you, you yourselves can um, impact the park incredibly positively. Um, and seeing gorillas in the wild is, is quite profound. And just to give you some context, next door in Rwanda, the country earns just under $500 billion a year from effectively from gorilla tourism. So the potential for tourism to transform Virunga and Eastern Congo is enormous. Here in the front, please, on the right-hand side. Uh, yeah. Uh, no, I don't have a question, but I actually was going to, to answer the question, but you've answered it partially, is that the United Nations peacekeepers are called peacekeepers because they're actually authorized by the Security Council when they are mandated is to keep the peace. So they are not deployed unless there is peace for them to keep. And it depends on what mandate they are given by the Security Council. In this case, after the event of the M23, the Security Council authorized a new uh, rapid intervention brigade, which actually took part, as, as, as uh, Ornado said, in alliance with the government in pushing M23, which led to their eventual surrender. So you have to look at what their mandate is and what they have been authorized to do and what equipment they have to deal with it. Are there other questions? Uh, the woman in the center at the back. 
I see her hand raised. Hi. Um, so I've heard multiple people tonight say, um, you know, that like with the UN General Assembly coming up, how there's such a small number of people that, you know, are the decision makers for, you know, putting things into action. And Melanie saying, you know, that her greatest fear um, is for people to see the film and not, you know, kind of forget about it. Um, so with both of those things where there, you know, there are, you know, a small number of people who get to actually put plans into effect, what can we do besides, you know, going there and visiting and contributing to tourism, but after seeing this film and going home, what is the best, you know, way for us to help? Sure. Okay. I mean, I, so... Uh, there's there's a there's a long there's a long term road for Virunga and there's a short term. The, the long term is 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 for the park to be protected, uh, for for the future for future generations of Congolese and and for the park to realise its potential for driving economic stability and um, and you know sustainability economic sustainability sorry and, and long term stability. But to get there, the the, the big threat overhanging everything is this illegal oil exploration. So. I, I d there's, there's four things that, that we ask people to do after, s after seeing this film. The first is, it's very simple, it's just to sign up at our website, which is virungamovie.com. And, and then you, we send you a newsletter every, every couple of weeks, and there's normally different asks in that newsletter, and, you know, and then when you get that, you can, you, if you, you can do those asks. And that's, that's really useful. The second is to spread the word as far and wide, on Twitter, on Facebook, everything, about what is happening in Eastern Congo. Um, and you know that 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 helps as well. That's that's really good. Thirdly, is you can donate directly to the park. It's very simple. It's virunga.org forward slash donate, and you can choose exactly where your donation goes. You can you can give money to Andre's work with Wolf and Mountain Gorillas. You can give money to a fund for the widows of rangers who've been killed trying to protect Virunga. And then lastly, I'd if if you're if you're fortunate enough to have shares. Look at look into your shares because you may not have shares directly in Soko International, but you will probably uh, anyone who has shares you, you quite possibly have shares in, in in other companies who they are institutional investors in Soko, and if that's the case, write to them and ask them what are they doing? Why you know what are they doing about what Soko is doing? You know, and, and are they putting pressure on Soko to to tr you know to answer the allegations put to it or put putting pressure on Soko to to publicly state that they will never explore or exploit oil in Virunga National Park within its current boundaries. So they're the four very simple things that, that we're asking people to do. Thank you. I'd um, add a couple more things. I mean, just to speak to the last point, I mean, the large institutional investors, the Norwegian Pension Fund, for instance, I mean, they play a key role. I think, believe they withdrew funds from SOCO um, after your film. And so there are things that can be done in terms of changing the cost-benefit calculus of companies and to sort of promote um, um, corporate compliance with good stewardship. But there are two other things you can do. Currently in Africa, we're facing a major crisis with elephant poaching. We're losing more than 23,000 elephants a year. It's a terrible tragedy and it's linked to war and it's linked to Al-Shabaab. Um, in, in Kenya, so it's got a terrorism link. And it's something we're not going to be able to confront unless we continue to invest in Africa. That is, if you can afford it, continue to visit Africa. The cost, um, uh, the, the value of an, of an elephant um, alive in Kenya in tourism is a million dollars per elephant. Okay, it's well more than the value of that elephant dead. And it... Uh, the cost-benefit calculus for Kenya to continue fighting to protect these animals will very much depend on the resources that you bring to them. But secondly, in your consumption decisions, as consumers, we need to become educated in terms of the implications of, a, of any purchase choice that we make. You know, for a long time, the war in Eastern Congo was spawned, amongst other things, by um, r precious metals, um, um, rare earths, they're called, which are used in the manufacture of cell phones which is these, you all have one. And um, that spawned conflict immediately south of Goma and, and the Virungas um, in another very important protected area with lowland gorillas, which has been devastated by it. But companies like Apple have chosen to exercise you know, their due diligence in their purchase decisions and not to purchase um, rare earths from, from conflict zones. 
And not all companies do that, but it's worth checking. Um, these things are advertised. Um, you know where these things are coming from. So education is important, and our decisions are really important. So we can all make a difference. It's not up to just a few people who are going to speak at the UN next week. It's up to all of us, the global citizenship. Uh, the gentleman in the white shirt. Thank you for this presentation and your, your remarkable film. Um, one of the uh, challenging things in this is not only Soko's involvement, but the, their, the seeming blessing of the Congolese government of, of their exploitation of Virunga. And you know, there seems to be almost a contradiction because the Congolese army pushed back the rebels, which is one agenda, but they also seem to have given sanction to the, the exploration and the potential exploitation of the park itself. And I think this is happening throughout that region of Africa. And I'd be interested in a discussion about that and, and what, because we're much more limited in what we can do in putting pressure on, on those political entities. Well, I, th I think the first thing I should probably say is, is that it's, it's actually, it's, qu it's quite complicated. I mean, the Virunga National Park is, is a government institution. Um, the rangers are government officers, and they are all against what Soko is doing. So, you know, it's 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 not just the government are in favour of what Soko is doing. There's there's a lot of people who absolutely aren't. And what the Congolese government has done, which is sort of fair enough, they've they've carved up areas in the east of the country and put them as as, as potential as oil concessions. Um, the one that Soko's in is is called Block Five. Now, half of that block is outside of the Virunga National Park. And Soko could quite legally go and explore for oil outside of the park. But they've chosen to only look for oil inside Virunga National Park, and that is illegal, and that's the problem. Yeah, I mean, I, I, d I don't know the answer to that question, but the, the, the blocks cover like a, a, a quite a big area of the country. It just happens that the park was in, is in one of them. I'm sorry to have to say this, but all over the world, 13% of the planetary land surface is now a protected area in some shape or form. All over the world, you have um, competing claims um, for these lands and um, overlapping um, extraction, um, um, uh, prospecting rights, and so on. Um, even in developing countries such as my own, where there's a conversation around um, developed countries such as my own, I should say, um, the UK, where there's a conversation about fracking in national parks. Um, so this is an issue which is a, a global concern, and I think it does go back to the issue around population growth and consumption and how we're going to sustain our lifestyles on this planet and how we make the difficult choices, the trade-offs that need to be made. And for that, I'm sorry to say it, governance. It's, it's critical be able to sort of make sure that it's transparent, why we're doing it, how we're doing it, and the difficult choices are made, and there's proper compensation um, offsets and, and, and the like um, where there's no alternative. But that's not happening in most of the cases. I mean, we're sort of bit by bit. It's, it's, it's death by a thousand cuts, and that's the problem. So, I mean, one of the most, I'll just ask one question and then return. The, the, the film is also extremely powerful because it, it appears uh, from the text that, that comes at the end to have had a very direct kind of impact. And then there was this whole thing about Soko in the press and so on. So could you talk about, I mean, obviously you couldn't have anticipated that, um, but the response that you've received to the film and what you feel its, its effect has been on, on the park itself. Sure. Um, I mean, we, we've been, you know, we've been completely blown away by how the film's been received and the attention that it's brought, um, not just in the media, but, but you know, in politicians, the business community, uh, on, on this issue. Um, and uh, what I should probably tell you all is that on the 11th of June, um, SoCo made a joint announcement with WWF that they were actually going to halt their oil exploration in, in the park. And when we all heard that, we were like, that, this is the best news ever. This is incredible. Um, and you know, th there there'd been this apex of pressure that had built up to that moment. It seemed like it was a real victory. It, it only took us about a couple of hours to realize that it wasn't anything of the sort, to be honest. Um, I mean, WWF have a very different interpretation to what that announcement means than SOCO. WWF have claimed that it's a big victory, whereas for SOCO, it's very much business as usual 
um, the following day after the announcement, we were leaked an email from Soko's number one person in Congo to to the Prime Minister, which which said, you know, we're actually we're not going anywhere. Um, we had to make this announcement to appease um, the Western media. Um, and Soko's deputy CEO made a statement in the in the Times newspaper, which sort of suggested that now the m the Congolese government should declassify the park so that they could come back and um, you know and then essentially e explore exploit oil completely legally. So the announcement uh, is effectively meaningless. Virunga is just as vulnerable as as it as it ever has been. And um, it's that's why it's so incredibly important that we continue to, to fight to protect it. Other questions? Uh, the gentleman in the blue shirt at the front, if the microphone could just be brought in the third row. Orlando. Uh, in the film, you demonstrated that the, the park was a strong source of regional and national pride for the people. And then you also represented later in the film that either through bribes or forces of propaganda that Soko was trying to you know, influence that, that public opinion. So in addition to the rangers holding the front line and sort of doing, doing triage at times, are they also being proactive in ways as far as trying to influence public opinion on their own, whether it's through environmental education or, or programs you know, in addition to just the, the work that they're doing as, as soldiers? Sure. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Absolutely. There's there's lots of outreach work in in communities around the park. Uh, I mean, the you know you I spent a lot of time in communities within the park on the edges of the park, and there's an amazing amount of goodwill and hope for what Virunga represents. I mean, just you know, it, Rodrigue says it in the film that that 140 rangers have have died trying to protect Virunga, and the reason every day those rangers wake up and know that it could be their last is is because they all believe in the potential this place has to transform the region for the better. I mean, it's, there's been 20 years of, of war there. And Virunga, through, you know, through the, the, the economic development projects that it's doing, through tourism, through fisheries work, agricultural work, all of this together, hydropower, there's an amazing hydropower, big hydropower project at the moment. All of this together, this, this really can drive long-lasting, sustainable development. And with that comes stability and hopefully lasting peace. Yeah, and, and you feel though that there's there's kind of adequate, you know, education and, and um, you know, um, uh, kind of, you know, promotion of those values so that the local people are kind of have ownership and are aware of, of, of the importance of that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, th I think, you know, th th if there's scarce resources, it could always be better, of course, but th there is those sorts of processes are, are very much playing out in and around the park, definitely. Thanks. We only have a few more minutes left. So uh, uh, um, the lady at the back, she has her hand raised in the white. Thanks very much. My question is similar to the gentleman's who just, who just asked, but on top of that, I'm assuming that SOCO is employing a lot of Congolese, and maybe that's a huge incentive for them to want companies like SOCO or other multinationals to stay. Is that true or not true? Um, it's 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 not that true. I mean, you know, th they employ. I mean, they employ a lot of foreign contractors, which you some of which you saw in the film. Um, uh, they're not employing lots and lots of Congolese people at all. I mean, uh, you know, their public announcements are that in the future they will provide you know loads and loads of jobs and everyone will be enriched. I mean, I think the history of Congo has has shown. You know, it's it's one of the world's. It's one of the. It's there's a famous phrase: Congo's the world's richest country with the poorest people. Um, you know, resources uh, like like oil have tended to just not trickle down to to local people and people around the lake. You know, where where the oil is potentially there. I mean, they're well aware of that fact that they're never going to get a job as an oil engineer. I mean, that you know, they 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 fish. They're fishermen. Um, so you know, people aren't bl hoodwinked by what Soko is telling everybody. And even you know, that it's it's not in the film, but we have on. On interview, you know, one of Soko's guys saying, "Yeah, you know, the very few people around here are actually going to get jobs out of this." Uh, the gentleman at the back with a hat. Hello. Okay. Yeah, I know you were uh, mentioning a Soko's British-based company. Now, I was curious though: is the Belgian government doing anything to contribute to helping the situation because of all the atrocities that they actually committed there? 
are they involved in like any type of <laughs> I don't know, reparations or, or funding so that, you know, as I hate poaching, I hate the fact that these animals are endangered, but part of it is the economic incentive. And when they invaded, they changed the whole economic makeup of the country. Are they doing anything to put money in the country so that it doesn't seem like uh, uh, a proper lucrative thing to do, killing animals or anything else that they're doing to help? Well, I, I mean, <laughs> you might be better placed to answer some of that. But I wha what I will say just about SoCo is that, yeah, they are a British registered company founded by, by French people, and the CEO and the deputy CEO are, are American. So it's a very much a kind of international company. Um, uh, in terms of the Belgian government, um, I mean, like, you know, like, like, like a number of governments, they've come out with statements against SoCo's illegal oil exploration. And, you know, I'm no expert on Belgium's development, Department of Development, but, um, you know, I'm, I, I know that there is, there is one and they are putting resources into issues in the Congo. I think we have time for one last question. Um, the gentleman in the red shirt. Orlando, um, we're talking about SoCo, but who else is there? I, um, I feel like there's probably more than one multinational petroleum company working in the area, and, and we're focusing, the film is specifically focusing on Runga and SoCo, but like, for instance, last year I was in Uganda at Murchison Falls National Park, and um, I, I was making a television show, and I, you could see from the air and on the ground that there was a lot of exploitation going on when I asked our fixers what was what was the, the issue, they said, well, the government doesn't care. And I don't think that's only SoCo working just north of Barang Barunga. So um, is there anybody else there to focus on? Y I mean, the answer is yes. But what, uh, what I should say is that Total, which is a much bigger oil company than SoCo, they also had a concession which covered part of the Barunga National Park. And last or a year and a half ago, they actually came out very publicly and said, we will never explore for oil within the current boundaries of the Virunga National Park. So even if those boundaries were changed, they would still never explore for oil in there. So it's, it's not to say that all multinationals that are operating there will, will do bad work. But in this particular case, I mean, SoCo are just acting in a way which I think is completely disgraceful. So with that, I'm afraid we have to end because we're out of time on behalf of Envision. I'd like to thank all of you for coming and, of course, our, our panelists, Orlando and Nick. Thank you so much. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you.